Thank you. Um, thank uh, the institution of the, uh, the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy for for its kind invitation to speak to you today. Um, uh, this is uh, been slightly improvised because there has been some uh, technological IT difficulties which have prevented uh, some communication, clear communication in the past days. Uh, but in any case, um, all is well which ends well. And I'm, I'm very happy to be able to address you for 15, 20 minutes on the issue that uh, 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 Mark has, has uh, mentioned. Uh, and this is the, the human rights um, protection in the Council of Europe. Um, I would like to, uh, however, to point out that as one sees the title, the general title of the conference, which is the role of international law to promote sustainable development, youth empowerment, women's rights, um, there are other um, instruments, and for, for a um, long time, I was in charge, among other things, of the uh, uh, European Treaty Office. So the Council of Europe, in addition to the human rights uh, treaties, it has a wide range of international or European uh, treaties which deal with multiple aspects, which might be of your interest, and I will be open to questions on other things which might go slightly beyond the purely human rights issues. Now, um, e my intention is to give you a, a general overview of, um, of uh, what the Council of Europe uh, is doing about human rights um, and how we, but maybe a bit pretentiously, consider that this is the house of human rights. Um, as you all know, the, the world, uh, the international community, has many different instances which deal with uh, governmental, intergovernmental, uh, non-governmental, which deal with issues of human rights. Uh, some people argue that human rights are the new religion of the 20th century. Um, uh, but we, uh, well, as I said, we can be, maybe we are a little bit pretentious to consider that we are the house of human rights. And this is um, um, this um, idea comes from the fact that the origins of the Council of Europe are very much linked to the issue of human rights. This uh, institution, which is a forum uh, of intergovernmental forum for debating and identifying the common interests of Europeans and to cooperate to achieve such an interest, um, was born in the aftermath of the Second World War. Um, this is a region, Alsace, where you are, and I hope you're enjoying it because the weather is um, astonishingly, astonishingly uh, perfect for this time of the year. Uh, but we are in the Rhine Valley. This is an area where in the past last 100 years, there have been three major wars with tremendous destruction and tremendous suffering for the populations of both sides of the Rhine. And the Strasbourg was chosen. Uh, the idea of creating a European forum where the European democracies after the war would cooperate instead of fighting each other was an idea of um, of uh, Prime Minister Churchill, actually. Uh, the war was coming to an end, and he thought, we cannot allow ourselves to continue like this. We have to find a different way of, of, of living together. Um, uh, and the idea was uh, never the same again, never one step backwards again. And we should create some structure that would allow us to put in common our com what, what we have, our common heritage, legal civilization, heritage, and work together to achieve our common goals and targets and objectives. Um, so the Council of Europe was 
conceived as an institution of general cooperation, but on three basic pillars, which were to uh, be the basis for any further developments of European cooperation. And those were the defense, the protection, the safeguard, and the promotion of human rights. The defense and promotion of democracy and democratic institutions, and the defense and promotion of the rule of law. So we could cooperate on anything. We could cooperate on the higher, the higher conventions on the liability of hotel keepers. This is something you wouldn't imagine nowadays in the Council of Europe, but uh, or traffic offenses or equivalence of diplomas. All this is European cooperation, but everything should be built on those three pillars. None of the acts, decisions, treaties, deliberations of the Council of Europe should undermine those basic pillars. And what is more, the purpose of creating a Council of Europe was precisely to establish the mechanism and the mechanisms that would protect those values, which are nowadays considered our general values, our common values, our common heritage. Now, the Council of Europe um, has, in the past 50 years, 60 years, strived to, to develop European cooperation in multiple aspects relating to public law, criminal law, human rights, um, commercial law, anything, education, culture. Um, but then, uh, at the end of the day, after 50 years of existence, we realized that we had um, the competition of other institutions which have, were doing the same things, maybe better than we could, uh, and that we should concentrate on the essentials, on the priority objectives of our organizations, which are the protection and promotion of human rights, um, the rule of law, and democracy. So progressively, a very wide and extended organization has focused more and more on its core values. Um, there are many reasons for that, but there is a very simple one you will easily understand, is that our budgets are shrinking, that there is less and less money for international organizations, um, and that uh, if we want to be effective, we should concentrate our, our means <coughs> on those issues which pertain almost exclusively, or at least primarily, to our organization. And these are the ones I've just mentioned. And also history uh, pushes up, uh, pushes us in that direction. Because the Council of Europe was established in 1949. As I say, a forum for cooperation on the basis of those core values, of course. Uh, but the first thing the Council of Europe did was some, something that no, nobody had ever done before, was to adopt a treaty which contained for the first time in history binding obligations relating to the respect of human dignity and fundamental rights and freedoms. You, you, some of you, some of you, you may have heard, but there was a declaration in 1948 by the United Nations, but still, it is only a declaration. What well, the Council of Europe was, was to go beyond that. And we don't want a, another declaration. We want to have a system by which individuals, states, can complain before an international court if they consider that the rights and freedoms of any individual in this continent are being violated. 
And this is the greatness of our system that we were able to establish in the context, I will not deal now with the influence of the Nuremberg trials and the federalist movement in Europe towards the creation of a judicial system where individuals could come and complain. Complaining against it's whom? Against their own states. You must imagine that uh, up to then, and even now, states are the main actors of the international community and of international law. When we talk about international, national mean governments, the governments of, of the member states, the governments of the recognized in the, in the, by the international community. And here, for the first time, it was acknowledged that the victim may have a say and should be able to complain. And this is what has made the difference. If I may simplify slightly, um, the original treaty, the European Convention of Human Rights, which dates back to 1950, um, included a clause which allowed the person, group of persons or group of individuals who believe that have been victims of a violation of the rights recognized in the convention should be able to bring their case to the European Court of Human Rights. Originally, this was done in a very, in a, certainly in a restrictive manner. There were strict conditions on admissibility. Not any complaint could be admitted and it could be examined as to its merits. Um, there were not many rights which were recognized. One of the things which is funny is that you go to the preamble of the convention and you will say, you will see that it says that the contracting party, the drafters of this treaty, intended to protect some of the rights recognized of the, by the declaration uh, the UN Declaration of, on Human Rights, they did not intend to recognize them all, just a few, just some of them. So the number of rights included in this machinery were necessarily limited. Why? Because we had the other side, because we wanted to protect effectively those rights. And therefore, in the convention, you take the convention and you have uh, 14 articles uh, which deal with rights and 50 other articles which deal with the machinery. How to protect them? How to have access to the European jurisdiction and complain about your state or any state which is a party to this convention? At the end of the day, um, there have been, in addition to the original treaty, there have been 16 additional um, protocols which complement um, the right uh, originally recognized have increased, there has been an increase in the number of rights. They have also improved the mechanism, making it more, um, more swift, more direct, more easily accessible. Um, so the, the system has improved over the years, we could, we could say. But there has been an element which has uh, been of major importance. Um, and that is that the Europeans, or better said, those who were under the jurisdiction of a European state, felt that they had a European remedy in addition to their own. The Court of Human Rights is not an institution which will be called to decide on any case. It is a subsid there is a, the principle of subsidiarity. It, this comes from the First or Second World War. The feeling that we needed someone to overlook what states were doing in the field of uh, human dignity and human rights. It was felt that a state that ignores the rights of its own citizens 
at the end became a danger for the population of the world as a whole. So the idea is to establish a system which comes after the national protection has failed in its mission to protect. Because we are not, we are not inventing rights here. Most of the rights that are recognized by the convention and even by most of these protocols were already recognized in the constitutions of the 19th century and of the 20th century of our own member states. The problem is to establish something on top of them which may, know, uh, may uh, react uh, in favor of human rights when the national systems are being captured or are being uh, unnecessarily restrictive to create a legal basis all over Europe where the same basic rights would be guaranteed. It doesn't prevent any state to be to guarantee more rights, but it, they, they sh no state should be allowed to go be below a certain level of protection. But my point is in this is that the citizens um, let me let me first explain something. The original idea of the of the drafters of the treaty was to establish a system, uh, as I say, of, of vigilance, of uh, of overview of what's happening in each state. Um, th th there were cases in the Society of Nations where the international community felt deprived of any instruments to interfere in what was going on in certain parts of our continent, which you will easily think of. So the idea was that any state could bring a claim, a complaint, to the European Court of Human Rights to complain about the way any other state was treating its own citizens. So that there would be a sort of, as I said, general overview. But additionally, as a sort of small door or back door, they said, well, maybe also the citizens themselves could also be entitled to bring these cases. And in reality, the reality has been totally different. In 60 years of existence, the court has had 22 interstate applications. In 22 cases, one state has brought a complaint against another state. And we have had more than 200,000 300,000 individual applications. And psychologically, it's easy to understand who is going to defend your rights better than yourself. If you feel you're being a victim, you will go wherever you have to go to try to obtain redress to that, um, to that um, violation of your, of your rights, a breach of your rights. And therefore, Europeans have come here by the millions. Every NGO, every individual, every um, person deprived of his liberty, every person who thought that the trial uh, he was subject to did not follow the requirements of a trial, every person whose article was not published because it was a restriction or because it was considered defamatory, would bring here his case. And this makes it one after one after one after one millions. Nowadays, nowadays I, maybe you would be have an interest and you could obtain this. This is the annual report I received yesterday from the court, which contains the statistics on the numbers of our complaints and uh, decisions and judgments of the court. There is no international court in the world that would deal with such a number of cases. I remember when I was do doing international law, the International Court of Justice in The Hague would have one, two judgments per year. Well, here we're talking about 100,000. Means that all these materials, these um, living situations, these problems of compatibility between the legislation and the personal life of citizens, of discretionality of the state, exaggerations, um, will come here. And on that basis, this forms a huge basis of cases 
which have enabled the court to develop an ex extensive case law, which has extended the rights beyond which uh, were uh, originally intended for. Let me take an example, um, but there are many. Rights of LGBTs nowadays are in fashion. Uh, this is a subtopic that everyone is talking about. The right to marry, and the right to have children, the right to have the new identity recognized by transsexuals. Um, well, when, we, when I started, when I was working for the court, I remember the first cases where there were countries in Europe where uh, being an homosexual was a crime. You could be sent to jail. I'm not talking about faraway places. I'm talking about Europe. I'm talking about Ireland. I'm talking about United, uh, Northern Ireland. I'm talking about Cyprus, where there were provisions in the criminal code which would send you to jail because you were a homosexual. And I told the court to start by saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. The sexual life is part of one's identity, one's private life. Why should the state interfere in that? And the, the government of, of the United Kingdom, this is the case of, I'm thinking about the case of Dutchen against the United Kingdom, in Northern Ireland said, well, where does it say in the convention that homosexuals have the right to have their own sexual life. It doesn't say that, but it says that everyone has the right to private life. And we consider that sexual behavior is part of one's private life. Therefore, interfering with the law in the way you interact with others sexually, if you are, of course, adults and you have consented to the, uh, to the, to the relationship, um, is an interference which is not necessary in a democratic society, and therefore is against the convention. And the laws were changed in many countries because of that. Not only in those which were part of the, to the litigation here, but many others followed because they said, well, if I don't, so don't do something, and this is what they call the erga omnes, if I may use the Latin um, um, expression, erga omnes effect of um, European judgments. That's very often a judgment which is directed against the state. Then there are other countries which were not part in that litigation, but they say, if I, do, I have a similar situation in my country, I may get a case soon because it will be no newspapers, NGOs do a perfect and very important role, have a very important role in that in extending knowledge about the cases. Um, and therefore, I will get cases and I will be punished myself. And I will have to pay indemnities and prejudice and will have to change my legislation. So I'll do it beforehand so I don't get any cases. Um, so a judgment in Estrasco may have uh, uh, a very large effect, not only in the country where uh, which was defendant in the case, but also in others. Uh, some very intelligent um, NGOs um, have made use of the system to f bring forward the ideas, the proposals uh, of social change. For example, um, the UK NGOs um, acting and militating against corporal punishment made use of the system until they got a judgment here in the structure which said that punishing corporally a boy or a girl in a school in front of the others was indeed a, an infringement, a breach of the right of family life, private life, etc. So that by the use of this, and, and of course they had to select cases, those which were complaining were individuals which had suffered, had suffered um, this kind of uh, corporal punishment. But behind all this was a very powerful, well-organized, dynamic, NGO movement militating against corporal punishment in the United States, which was, as a consequence, reduced to the minimum 
and disappeared. Um, there are many examples of that. As I say, individuals are the best protectors of their own rights. If they feel their rights have been neglected, they come here. Um, at the beginning, it could have, uh, it was felt that someone uh, bringing a complaint against his own state was kind of treason, high treason. Nowadays, they come here by the thousands. And the problem of this court, what is the problem of this court, and we are now in the challenges ahead, um, is that it is so difficult to deal in time with so many complaints. When you, this is an international court. Um, there are how many millions of individuals in Europe? You may even know the figure better than myself, but several hundred millions of people complaining. Um, many of them may not have um, suffered a, a, a true violation. They are even um, what they call querulants, people who complain about anything. But every single case is examined. Every single case is examined. And the court is composed of judges elected by the Parliamentary Assembly. And these judges um, deliver justice. And in many cases, they say that there has been a breach of the convention and the state has to um, repair the damage caused. Um, the number of cases in which uh, the victim receives uh, uh, a redress from the uh, financial redress from the state is very, very, it happens very frequently. And in many other cases, the, the, the decisions themselves lead to individual measures of redress, which are not financial in, in, in nature, or even in changes of legislation. There have been laws and even constitutions which have been changed as a result of uh, judgments of the court. The judgment of the court in the Fiji case, uh, Fiji and Setchi, I think it is. So my Bosniak is not very good. But it was a case against Bosnia, a recent case, where the court found that the Bosnian constitution, which results from Dayton, the Dayton Agreement, which stopped the war many years ago in Bosnia, uh, it was discriminatory. It was in breach of the convention because certain uh, minorities were not entitled to participate in political life in Bosnia. And they said, well, now you have to execute the judgment. And the execution of the judgment is creating tremendous trouble because it involves change of the constitutions. And the three basic ethnic groups in Bosnia are unable to agree on the changes which are needed. But at the same time, the EU, and this is again a question of leverage. As I say, NGOs were using judgments of the court as leverage to promote certain social changes. Well, the EU is using the case law of the court in order to promote, uh, to say, if you want to have an accession agreement with the EU and trade um, privileges and, uh, you know, Bosnian products being sold in the European market, which is huge, if you want to have this kind of agreement, first execute the judgment of the court, change your constitution, because you're, you're not in line with European standards. So this is part of the negotiation for the accession of Bosnia and Herzegovina to a partnership or association agreement with the EU to say that they need to have first uh, the constitution in line with the requirements as established of, by, the court, uh, by the court. Let me briefly, um, I've extended myself and I want to leave you some time for asking questions. Um, let me... Uh, um, just mention some of the problems. I mentioned the first one, which is the, the huge amount of cases which are pending. The need to speed up, simplify even, even more the system so that cases are dealt with in a speedier manner. The need to involve different authorities at national level. It's not only a problem for governments or even for courts. The basic protection of human rights is carried out at local level and if you think about housing, education, discrimination, um, um, 
there are many aspects, detention in some cases, local police uh, committing uh, excesses. Uh, so we need to involve in the protection of human rights authorities at all levels uh, internally in order to reduce the flow of cases which come up to Strasbourg. Strasbourg, after all, is far from, let's take uh, any city in southern Spain, Ecija, for example. Ecija is placed in near Sevilla. But Ecija is far from Strasbourg. Maybe there are many problems which can be solved in Ecija and not come all the way to Strasbourg and have 47 highest lawyers in Europe dealing with the case. Um, we need to establish filters, some kind of filters at national level to reduce this, this um, increasing flow. Even this year, is, uh, again, there have been 70,000 additional cases introduced in 2003. Um, and even if the productivity of the court has increased by 10 in the last years, um, we had simplifications like introducing a single judge formation. There are many cases that are examined just by one judge. In the past, that was impossible. When I was a lawyer there, every case had to be examined almost in plenary. Um, then there were the chambers, and then there were the committees, and now there are single judges deciding on cases. Well, all these, all these improvements um, uh, have not been sufficient to, to reduce the amount of cases, and, and um, the court may take a long time to, to, to take a, a decision. Um, I uh, sometimes exaggerate a little bit when I say the longer the case um, lasts in, in, in the court, before the court, the better chance you have of winning. Because if they could get rid of it quickly, they would. So don't get too disappointed if your case, you bring a case and it takes two, three, four, five years. Uh, although the, the, the length is decreasing. This is one of the, of the main um, uh, challenges. Um, the other challenges, of course, are adapting to changes. The, the convention dates back to 1950. Um, this is being done through protocols, I've said, but also through jurisprudence. Jurisprudence is evolving. And this creates problems with the states, because the states say, hey, I agree that you would be competent to decide on cases on this, this, and this. But you're going far beyond. You're deciding on LGBTs. What, what, what? There were no LGBTs in 1950s. Or if there were, nobody knew about them. How come you are now deciding that they have the right to marry? Well, the, the, the court has always said needs to adapt. He adapts, uh, and, and, and in, this, in this respect, I insist the private individuals and civil society has an important uh, say. Um, another challenge is to disseminate much better the judgments. As I, as I said, they may have sometimes, they do have, erga omnes effect. A case which is decided once uh, may provoke changes in legislation and avoid breaches of human rights in other states, which were not even part of the litigation. And the Council of Europe has also tried to introduce other changes which are complementary to the court. And I will stop there. Um, the court is, of course, the cornerstone of the whole uh, of the whole building, human rights protection building. Um, it has uh, uh, it is um, overburdened uh, by cases, but it's still the cornerstone. Uh, there are 800 lawyers working there uh, every day with cases in all the possible languages. Um, and and um, and it is important to to add new basic human rights. But there is a trend which I personally resent to consider everything as a basic human rights. I think if we want to be serious, we should be a bit restrictive and acknowledge the limitations of the um, of the judicial system. We cannot 
call everything fundamental right and then say the court should judge. Now there are trends of talking about fourth or fifth generation uh, human rights, the right to, um, to peace. Let's mention one. Is this really um, a right? I'm not saying that it is not important. Peace is, is absolutely essential. Um, but uh, I, I would write that this is a, 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 a kind of right which can be decided by the court of law. Well, it's rather diplomacy, it's rather um, questions of powers. Uh, um, we should ask the system to produce what it can produce and not to, because it has been successful in dealing with, with basic human rights and, and protecting human dignity sometimes at a very basic level, and not try to make it do things that it cannot do. But we have to adapt to new circumstances, rights which were not, as I said, which were not even thought of at the time of drafting, are coming and are felt by our societies as being, as being essential. The rights, I'm thinking, for example, for the right to the protection of the environment. There may not be a general right for the protection of the environment, but one may have a right, and the court has said it in a number of judgments, that everyone lives in an environment which is respectful of his family life, private life, that you're not uh, forced to live in a dump. And there have been cases where the court has said, well, the passivity of the authorities in face of a terrible environmental situation amounts to a breach of the victim's right for the protection of his private life or of his life, to short. Huh? So there is, there is a trend. Our societies are more sensitive to the, to the notion of rights and there is a need to, to adapt and, and maybe sometimes to, to legislate, to, to make new protocols, adding new rights. Uh, this is becoming more and more difficult because precisely the, since the machinery has become very powerful, states are more and more um, cautious about adding new rights to the mechanism. And sometimes the creation of these rights is made by case law. Um, certain rights are not included in the system. And the court has said several times Social and economic rights are protected by a separate mechanism, um, which is the European Social Charter, which is also a binding instrument, which recognizes rights, fundamental rights, in the area uh, of social protection and economic rights. Um, now, these rights are generally protected through a different system, uh, but again, there, there is the, the protocol on collective complaints, which enables NGOs to bring social rights cases to the knowledge of the European Committee of Social Rights. And sometimes also even the judgments of the court may have an important social impact. Sometimes the financial consequences of a judgment of the court May even may, may be even higher than complaints uh, made on the basis of the European Social Charter. Think about requirements of, uh, of fair justice. Well, fair justice uh, involves a lot of requirements. And this means expenditure. You may need to have uh, judges well-trained who are independent, but you have to have enough judges because the pro procedures need not to be too too long because there is a basic human right to have justice delivered in a reasonable time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, 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 the division between social rights and individual and political rights is not so clear every time. But there is an additional system which protects social rights. There are also other mechanisms. The trend in the Council of Europe has been to associate new conventions to the establishment of follow-up mechanisms. Um, a treaty is worth what the monitoring system is worth. A, a treaty without a monitoring system very often becomes paper, written paper, 
no consequence. Some countries are tradition of being respectful of their international obligations, some others are not. So unless you have a system which can criticize and control and recommend improvements and inspect, and we have systems like that for the protection of national minorities, for the protection of uh, minority languages, for, for the protection uh, of discrimination, for the protection of uh, against corruption, uh, for the protection of children, for the protection of trafficked, pers uh, of trafficked persons. The basic structure of the European Court of Human Rights has been complemented by uh, a whole set for the, the Convention for the Prevention of Torture, which has created a, do a mechanism which allows our experts to go to any person where a person, any place where a person may be detained to check that this person is being treated correctly. Well, this is happening every day. And this is a very effective mechanism. It is a prevention, but it is about human rights and it complements the, the work of the court, which only acts ex post facto. Finally, I would like to finish without at least making a reference, if not only because I worked for it uh, for several years, the mechanism of the uh, Commissioner for Human Rights. The Commissioner for Human Rights is a kind of European mediator. It is a preventive mechanism to a large extent because it has no formal requirements. It doesn't need any complaint. It can go anywhere. And access should be given to it to anywhere. It can go to detention centers, to mental hospitals. I've participated in visits of the Commissioner. We've visited places I never even thought they existed. Um, places where children are being uh, educated, um, uh, police stations, um, transport, they are all aspects of, of human life may have uh, a component of, um, of human dignity and a requirement of, human, of, 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 uh, of a dignified treatment of persons. So the, 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 the commissioner has the power to, to visit and to make recommendations to any government at any stage without any identified procedure um, to improve its human rights records and also something which is very important to go to the press. And let me tell you just an example which I personally lived and I will finish with this, I promise. Already I have talked for, for ages. Um, Elvira is looking at me like that. Uh, so I'll stop my, my, my chat. Um, and let you ask a question if you wish. Um, I remember the, the Commission of Human Rights was visiting France, decided to, and, and President Sarkozy was at the time Minister of the Interior. It dates back 19, 2006, I think it was, or 2007. So the, the visit to France was organized, all the places he wanted to visit, the regions, the, um, he moved around the country. By the way, he did so in many other countries. I also participated in a visit to Russia. But let's, con let's talk about the, 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 the use of the media, an intelligent use of the media by the commissioner. Um, and, th and therefore, um, he visited some places of detention which were considered uh, to be substandard. He said, this is not acceptable that a developed country like France has people staying in, in dirty dumps like this without doing anything about it. You need to invest m money in having a proper, clean, decent place for these people while they're waiting trial, or while they're waiting to be expelled, or while they're, because they're refugees or asking for refugee status or whatever the reason was. So he went there and he made a stand. And uh, as usual, the media were informed of the visit of the commissioner and the commissioner got a question um, during, um, during his visit, uh, precisely the day he had visited those, those unacceptable detention places. And he was asked, well, are you going to see the Minister of the Interior? By the time every French knew, every French person and almost every, per every person in Europe knew that Mr. Sarkozy intended to become the president, which he did some years later. Um, and he said, are you going to meet uh, Minister Sarkozy to talk about these things? 
And he said something like, uh, well, it was my intention to meet, meet with uh, Sarkozy. Uh, I have just been informed that Mr. Sarkozy has canceled the meeting. He's certainly a very busy person. And certainly his obligations uh, make it impossible for him to meet with the European Commissioner for Human Rights. Well, this was like a bomb in all French newspapers reproducing. Uh, and the following day, we were getting in, the, in my office a call from the private office of the minister saying, of course, Mr. was a mistake. Of course, Minister Sarkozy, or President Sarkozy, as you want to call him, intended to meet as long as necessary the Commissioner for Human Rights. And, and they use the, the, the intelligent use of the media without abusing it may also be um, one of the instruments that the commissioner uses more effect efficiently. Um, now I let you speak because I'm, I'm tired of speaking. Uh, I've bored you for long enough. So um, thank you for your attention anyway, for your patience. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I remain at your disposal should you have any, any query, any comment, any criticism. Certainly I've said many stupid things. Um, so don't hesitate. Um, after all, uh, we are under the protection of the European Convention of Human Rights, which protects the right of freedom of expression, which I invoke here before you, and that you may invoke in criticizing me too. Um, please, um, it was my pleasure talking to you.